are here with us in person or online, we are glad that you are here. I'm Pastor Don. It is a joy for me to uh, worship with you uh, this morning. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, you are the creator and sustainer of us all. Today, we want to worship you with gladness and come into your presence with singing. We invoke your presence among us today so that none leave this place without the deep assurance of your love, with a strong confidence of your faithfulness, with a fresh and full commitment to live by your power and by your glory. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Please join in our prayer of reconciliation. You know, O oh God, how pleased we can be with ourselves and how little we remember you. We confess that we are too ready to think bitterly of others and throw up barriers between them and us. Forgive us our pride that has so little reason and our concern for prestige that has so little importance. Forgive us for thinking so much of ourselves that other people's needs and sorrows hardly impinge on us. Make us less sure of our own goodness and more sure of your forgiveness and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of assurance from the Apostle John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and all forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Know that you are forgiven. Now, having received such an amazing gift of grace and peace in Jesus Christ, let us share it with each other. May the peace of our Savior Christ be with you all. And let's share the peace of Christ with each other with a wave 
or a text or any greeting that's available to us. Move on. Prayer for understanding God's word. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for the heavenly food that is, may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our lesson from the early church is Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. In your pew Bible, that's page 1824. The armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flowing arrows of the evil, flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep, out of, keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel from which I am an ambassador and in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. The word of the Lord. Good morning once again. It's a joy to be here. Our gospel reading is from John six fifty six through sixty nine. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would uh, be here with us, that your presence would be real and alive. Lord, teach us from your word. Do not let these words come back empty, but let us internalize them and make them a part of our, our lives. We just thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Survival is instinctive. 
It is wired into our DNA, whether it's surviving a natural calamity, like a hurricane, earthquake, surviving a terrible illness or pandemic, our base impulse is to survive. These are all external events that come from outside, but for most of us, or should I say more often, it is the internal threats that can linger for years. It could be depression or grief, it could be habits of addiction that unwind our lives. And just like external threats, we have to figure out how to survive. And that's what our lectionary readings, uh, particularly Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, uh, go over. Ephesians will be my primary text, uh, and I will use the passage. More than just about mere survival, our passages affirm our relationship and standing with Jesus Christ and Christ alone. We rely on our relationship with our Lord and stand firmly in what only Christ can give us. I'm always real curious, outside our faith, how do we learn to survive? I brought with me today this is the Department of Army Field Manual, Survival. It's uh, actually the 1970 edition. However, it um, has things, if you're caught in the wilderness uh, and uh, you don't know how to survive, you know, how to make a snare or a trap. Uh, it uh, talks about certain edible plants that you can uh, use to, to eat. Uh, it uh, tells uh, some a whole chapter on if you're captured in a, as a prisoner of war, you know, what do you do? How do you handle it? Or how do you evade capture if you're behind enemy lines? My favorite in here is how to turn your pants or jeans into a life preserver if you're out in the open water. And I thought maybe I would teach this this morning, just in case. And uh, you're out there. You basically, you take off, you're, you're in the water, you're treading water, you take off your pants, you tie off the, the ends uh, the, of the pant legs, you turn it up and so you can get some air into it, and then you kind of hold it down below. You have to you keep trying to fill it up. You know, you have to kind of keep bringing it up for air. But you get some water wings out of it. And it's a way that you survive, can last for a while uh, if you're out in the open water. And it's all kind of nice to know. Uh, it's, uh, I always think of uh, uh, Earl and the Boy Scouts, they always say, be prepared. You know, that's cer certainly a, a matter of survival. And we have to survive in our world of competitive and sometimes very unforgiving. And the life that goes on around us, we learn from a very early age how to survive. And unfortunately, it is through gaining power, it is attacking your enemies and getting ahead. We go to school a lot of times simply to learn to survive in the outside world. Now, I managed to graduate from high school a whole year early when I was 17. I like to think it was because I was smart, but in actuality, I just didn't like high school and I wanted to figure out a way to get out. And I figured out how to beat the system. I learned to be a survivor in what for me was a challenging environment. When I was a freshman, I figured out what classes to take, what classes to avoid. Spent lots of time calculating the credit requirements and I became good at surviving high school and getting out as fast as I could. But we are people of faith, and we are different. Paul, the author and letter of the letter to the Ephesians, tells us, calls us to an inner strength that comes from God and gifts from God that he gives to us freely by his grace. 
Let's take a look at this passage in Ephesians, verses 10 through 12, to start. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul sets out a painting a picture, and it is not a good one. He makes it very clear that our greatest conflicts are with forces that assault us all the time. It is not always the external events, like hurricanes or tornadoes, that are going to get us down. Evil manifests itself in our world in a myriad of ways. And it's constantly changing, adapting, finding new ways to undermine us. It can be prejudices, the jealousies of others, betrayals, racism, corruption, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, and the scars that last sometimes for lifetimes. These are what assail us day in and day out. In verses 13 through 15, Paul shifts gears. He writes, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, he uses very much a military imagery, breastplates, armor, that sort of thing. And he uses this language to really get to the point and to make very, very clear the seriousness of the conflict. And then he comes to a point and he simply says, in everything, stand firm. Most of us have read the novel, uh, Harper Lee novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, or we've seen the film, or familiar with the film, familiar with the story. Atticus Finch is a small town lawyer, is called upon to defend an African uh, American citizen, falsely accused of rape. And embedded in the town culture is a deep racism that makes his winning the case impossible. His two, his two children are, are baffled. Why does he take a case that he knows he is going to lose? He explains to them that he has to see it through no matter what. He points out to them that he wants them to see that standing firm in courage is not a man with a gun. It is knowing that you are going to lose and seeing it through to the end. These are situations in our lives where doing the right thing, standing firm on an issue, will cost us. But we stand, we see it through to the end because it is the right thing to do. Going on in verses 14 and 15, he goes on with the military imagery to sharply illustrate his point. He writes, Stand firm, then, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And I want to point out something that each of these things are already in place. We have these things. They are a gift from God. We don't have to reinvent them. We have the truth. As a matter of fact, the way it is phrased here is already buckled around your waist. We just need to be reminded that it is here. 
He goes on and talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Fundamental to our Reformed Christian faith is the idea that we have a righteousness given by God through grace. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. This is a much-quoted verse. All Abraham did was believe God, and God's righteousness was conferred on him. A little theology lesson here. I went when Pastor Ashley comes back, you can all say, oh, you know, what do you think of imputed righteousness? It's a theological term. It actually goes back to uh, the great reformer Martin Luther, who taught, we have a righteousness that is imputed to us. It comes from God, comes from outside of us. It is not a righteousness that we have to manufacture or invent or even work towards or earn. We simply have to believe God and it is imparted to us just as Abraham did. Paul goes on in verses uh, 16 and 17. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Once again, they are already given to us. We don't have to go on a pilgrimage and search for them. We don't have to say some kind of incandation uh, to conjure them up. We simply have to wear them just as they are a part of us. Now, I've heard many uh, messages and lessons on this Ephesians passage. Uh, it is well-deserved. Uh, it's uh, as literature, it is theology, it is an extraordinary passage. It's powerful, eloquent, and beautiful. It uses descriptive metaphors, and I can sense as Paul writes it, it's almost like he's breathless as he's getting this out, as he pours out his words. But most sermons and messages and lessons that I've heard on this passage usually stop at verse 17. Yet I believe that the following verses are just as important. One of my favorite phrases is uh, when I'm in, taking on an endeavor or I'm, I'm learning something or I'm whatever it is I'm doing, I always say, well, what does it look like? And it's taking an abstract concept and turning it into a practical reality. One of the things I love about YouTube is you can just find about anything, how it looks, what it looks like. I changed my, my car battery a, a couple of weeks ago, and you go on YouTube and you see you can get several different possibilities of somebody that's taped changing a car battery. It's taking a theory and turning it into a practical reality. And for Paul, he comes to the point of how do you activate this eloquent language and ideas that are given and to bring them into the reality of your daily life. In verses 18 through 20, give us a start. We see it as a little glimpse of Paul's life. We catch a vision what this looks like in his day to day. When in verses 18 through 20, Paul writes this, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all God's, the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. 
Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Paul has shifted from the strong, beautiful metaphors, the eloquent language, to a deep and personal and sincere tone. He brings it all down to earth. He says to pray, pray, pray. For Paul, as it was for Jesus, prayer is the breath that gives and sustains our life. The Norwegian theologian and pastor Ola Halsby wrote this, likening prayer to breathing. The air which our body requires envelops us on every hand. The air itself seeks to enter our bodies and for this reason exerts pressure upon us. It is well known that it is more difficult to hold one breath than it is to breathe. We need but exercise our organs of respiration and air will enter forthwith into our lungs and perform its life-giving function to the entire body. The air which our soul needs also envelops us, all of us at all times and on all sides. God is round about us in Christ at every hand with his many-sided and all-sufficient grace. All we need to do is open our hearts. Halsby says what Paul is trying to live is trying to get across Every aspect of Paul's work and life is grounded in our life with God through prayer. What is the first step in putting on the breastplate or wearing the breastplate of righteousness or the armor of God? It starts with prayer. It is deeply personal and it is the very breath of life. Notice here that Paul prays for everything. Everything is covered. He mentions all occasions. He doesn't say, just pray about this or just pray about that. He wants to bring God into all arenas of our lives. He personally asked for prayer too. He asked that the community of faith pray for him. He is not ashamed to ask for their participation in his struggles. He wants and needs protection, and he is not afraid to ask for it. To conclude, I'd like to visit our passage, uh, John 6, 56 to 69, and it centers on Christ and who Christ is. These 13 verses are a part of a larger section of the Gospel of John. Uh, the whole piece is rather a, a heavy theological discourse. Uh, much of our understanding of Christ uh, and who he is comes from this. It details a series of arguments that were raging over theology, identity, and the question of who Jesus is. It comes down to an interesting point in verse 66 when it says that many of the disciples, and these are the people, the followers, uh, not the 12, it makes that clear, uh, kind of just gave up. They just, this is too much for us. We can't figure it out. We don't like it. It's too heavy. And they say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And they give up and they walk away. And these are people that have been following him for some time. And Jesus asked a question of the, the inner 12. Do you want to leave too? And Simon Peter comes back with, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter voices what we voice. Jesus is the one that is the source of all life. Christ is the way for us to survive. Jesus gives us an abundance of grace and resources to not only survive, but to thrive in our life in him. And so when we grow weary, 
We turn to Christ in prayer, rely on his resources, rely on the resources that he's already given to us in order for us to survive in this troubled world. And we put on the full armor of God by God's grace through prayer. Jesus is not only our last resort for survival, he is our best. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we uh, just come to you now and just pray and ask that you would take these words, help us, Lord, to, to pray to you, to rely upon the grace that you've given to us, the different resources that you've given to us. We live in a troubled world. Trouble is not far away. And we simply ask that you would be close and very near. Lord, help us to open up the doors of our hearts to you and to rely upon that which you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we uh, sing our, our next hymn, I just wanted to make a couple comments about now, thank we all our God. Uh, certainly a beautiful hymn, great hymn of the church. Uh, it was written in, uh, by Martin Rinkart. Lived in the 16th and the 17th century. Very interesting is that uh, when he took his pastorate in what is now Germany, the Thirty Years' War broke out, and it pretty much lasted his career. Uh, it was a devastating and horrific time. The, uh, a plague hit. Uh, pandemics are not new. They've been going on for thousands of years. In his particular region, it's estimated that about 8,000 people perished because of the plague. It says that he, uh, Rinkart, as pastor, did 4,000 funerals. Now, I've question that a little bit, uh, the number on that, and the only thing that I can figure out is that, in fact, they were probably mass graves. In other words, they were doing like 100 at a time, and uh, that accounts for the rather high number of, of 4,000. But it was a very troubled time, and yet he wrote this extraordinarily beautiful hymn, and uh, I just pray that as we... Uh, hear this and as we sing this we think of, uh, uh, of Martin Rinkert and what he was putting up with at that time. <laughs> he's coming, he's coming. <laughs>
Please be seated. Now is our time of prayer, and Paul tells us to pray, 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 pray. And uh, it's uh, an important part of our, our service uh, to be praying. Uh, certainly want to draw your attention to the uh, prayer request um, in the uh, back of the bulletin. Uh, many needs and issues uh, going on in the life of our, our congregation and our, our neighbors and our friends and our um, family. And uh, just uh, in, invite you to, uh, throughout this week, to, to take up some of those prayer requests. Uh, let's, let's go to prayer. Lord, we just come to you now, and we are people that need you in our lives. We need to include you in all that we do. We do live in a troubled world, and we need your protection. We need those things that you have given to us to be able to thrive and to do well. We pray for the, the many people uh, in need of healing, that are struggling with illness, with surgeries. We ask your presence for each of them. We pray for our people that are, are grieving a loss. Loved ones have passed away. And we ask that you would be close, that you would assuage their, their grief. That you would remind them that you grieve too. And Lord, we just ask that you would be there. We pray for our, our nation and our world. We're troubled by what we see on the news. We, we see the, the terrible situation in Afghanistan. And we just ask that you would not only protect our, our troops, but that you would take care of, uh, of, of the people. And it's such a hard thing to see. And we pray that uh, we would... Uh, continue to, to do what we can. We pray for our, again, our, our nation. We're just in grips of a, a terrible pandemic. We thought we had it whipped. And yet we're still struggling with it. And we pray for the, the medical people, the, the caregivers, that you would give to them extra strength, that you would bless them and take care of them. Lord, we just pray that we would um, see an end to this terrible time. And yet we know that you are present, that you give to us the strength and the resources to be able to, to get through it. We pray for our leaders. We pray, whether we agree with them or disagree with them, we pray that you would give to them the ability to do that which is good, for the common good. They put aside their selfish ambitions to serve all of the people. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for the churches here and in the area. We pray that we can continue to get the gospel out that we'd be of service to you and that we'd be seen by that by others. And we pray for the pastors and the leaders that you would give them strength to resist temptation and help them to grow. And we pray now as your son taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let us continue our worship by singing our sending hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us go out and serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.